thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. It's always a pleasure, always a pleasure to um, stand, open the Word of God, and read and preach. Um, it's a great opportunity, dear friends, this afternoon. We are still dealing with Exodus 20, and I want us to just open our Bibles right on uh, Exodus chapter 20, and I'll be reading from uh, verse 1 all the way to verse 16, um, but I'll be focusing on verse 13, um, you shall not murder. So let me read from uh, verse 1 all the way to verse 16. And God spoke all of these words, saying, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water or under the, water, the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation and of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant uh, or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner or whoever is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the, sab the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this afternoon for um, the fact that, God, you are still speaking. You are speaking, God. You speak through scriptures, and you show us the light of your word, and you guide us as your people. Help us this afternoon as we unpack this passage, Lord, together and give us insight, understanding, and give me clarity of thoughts and uh, simplicity of word. Help us, all of us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so if I may ask um, you and um, all of us here that we have so many benefits. We've got so many things that we can be grateful to the Lord. Um, so many things, just like we read in the book of Psalms 103, that we should not forget all the benefits that the Lord has lavished upon us. If you are to single out only one or two of the things that you are so grateful before the Lord this afternoon, what would that be? This is not a rhetorical question. Just you can, you can uh, give me an answer if you are ready. Whatever among the benefits, among the things that you enjoy, um, things that you know that you can be grateful to the Lord this afternoon, just single out one or two. What would that be? Yes, I'm alive and home. I'm alive and home, yes. Who else? And thank you for the answer because what we are looking um, at today, we are looking at um, the importance of life. How life is precious, how life is good, how, how life is a gift from God. And many times we take life for granted. And sometimes we don't even think of being so thankful because of the fact that we are all alive. We are all full of life and energy. So this passage is dealing with the Ten Commandments. We've been dealing with this series for the past two or three weeks or so. 
And um, what I will advise us to do first is to go through uh, what we call context of the passage. I teach hermeneutics, uh, which deals with um, um, the rules and principles of understanding, interpreting the Bible, and applying. And one of the things that I always emphasize to my students is reading the Bible in context. And context, as you know, is twofold. Uh, we see the historical, uh, cultural context of the passage that you are dealing with, and also the literary context that you are dealing with. Let me start with the literary context of this passage. Chapter 20 of the book of Exodus, um, is, it comes after chapter 19, of course, but chapter 19 is the arrival of the people of God, the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. Now, if you know your Exodus very well, you will know that chapter 1 of the book of Exodus up to chapter 12, verse 13, the Israelites are geographically in Egypt. They are under slavery. That is chapter 12 to 36, 1 all the way to chapter 12, 36. The moment you begin verse 37 of chapter 12, that's the Exodus. The people of Israel are now leaving, the, leaving Egypt. Now they are heading towards the promised land, but via uh, the wilderness. So from chapter 12 of Exodus, verse 37, all the way to chapter 19, verse 1, Israel, the Israelites are on the way going to Mount Sinai. So they took about two months uh, on the way, and the third month, the first day of the third month, they arrive at Mount Sinai. So chapter 19 already, we see the people of God uh, well uh, arrived in, 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 at Mount Sinai, and God has some dealings with them. So from chapter 19 up to the book of Numbers, up to the book of Numbers, chapter 10, verse 10, the Israelites, they are still at Mount Sinai. And there they are receiving instructions from the Lord, and the Lord is cutting a covenant with them. And so chapter 20 is actually, literally speaking, is part of the cutting of the covenant between God and Israel. Now, if you know very well what covenant means, covenant means it's a formalization of an existing relationship. So God is formalizing a relationship that had already existed between him and his people. So the relationship is not starting from chapter 20, God had already started relationship with them, but chapter, by the time we get to chapter 19, especially chapter 19, 20 up to 24, God is going through a ceremony of cutting the covenant, formalizing a relationship that existed. Just like marriage is also another form of a covenant. Uh, so the, the ceremony of marriage is, not, is also a covenant in the sense that it's a formalization of an existing relationship. So this, this girl and this boy uh, may meet at some point in time, and then uh, as they get to know each other, at some point, one of them will express the idea of formalizing a relationship. Let's make it formal. So marriage is a formal um, you know, way of making a relationship. So this is what God is doing in chapter 20. God is now formalizing a relationship that existed already between the people of God and himself. This is very important. Why is it important? Because many people think when they read the, the Ten Commandments that they are given to the people in order to make them people of God. So they should follow these rules, they call them rules, so that they may become the people of God. All we forget is that these people are already the people of God. There was already a relationship that started earlier on of these chapters, but we, the time we get to chapter 20 and we see the commandments, this is a formalization of a relationship that had already existed. So the Ten Commandments are not really given to make them people of God, but the Ten Commandments are given to the people of God, those who are already people of God, but in now in a formal way. Very, very important to take that. So when we bought our piece of land in Minwood, where we stay, Minwood area, so we first did what we call the clearing of land. I'm sure you all know, you are familiar with what we call the um, clearing of land. Land clearing is the process of removing trees 
you know, stamps and brush and stones and all obstacles that may come uh, uh, on your way as you think of starting any construction project. This is something we always want to do. As you may have noticed, dear friend, that this text we are dealing with, chapter 20, is not an easy passage. You may actually have noticed that the first preacher, the second preacher, all the previous preachers of this passage, they, what they did first was clearing the land because we have a lot of misconceptions, a lot of misunderstandings around the Ten Commandments. So we cannot just carry on and unpacking this passage without clearing the ground and making sure that our minds are clear in order to understand this passage very well. So one of the things I am doing this morning to clear the ground is to give you this context of the passage, um, but also we must understand that the Ten Commandments were given as part of the covenant, and in the Near Eastern culture, we should understand what it means. There's already an existing relationship which we need to understand. Have a look at verse 1, for instance, of chapter 20. And God spoke all of these words, saying, I am the Lord your God. He is already their God. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt? There is already a relationship. There's a story that has gone by between Israel and his people out of the house of slavery. It's from that existing relationship that has already existed that God is now unpacking, telling the Israelites um, how formal they should live with him and giving them the Ten Commandments as part of the Torah. Now, this may be something that you really know, um, but let me say we have difficulties in understanding certain categories, certain concepts in, as we unpack chapter 20. One of the things that we normally have misunderstandings is the understanding of the law. The way we understand the law today in the 21st century is not how the law was perceived in the, near, in the ancient Near Eastern culture, even in the Old Testament context itself. We think of law as set of rules, you know, set of rules that people, and most of the time, especially with the influence of the 20th and the 21st century, we think of the Ten Commandments as legislative law, which was a foreign concept in the category of the Old Testament. So when you come to the Ten Commandments with an idea of um, handling the, the sets set of rules that are needed to follow in order to become holy, in order to please God, you are already missing the point. That's not the point of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are part of what we call the Torah, and the Torah means instruction. So we have quite a number of them. It's a list of of regulations that are there to bring about the wisdom and the holiness of God. This is very important. You'll see as we move on, especially as we start now unpacking verse 13, you will see that God is not giving these as rules. It's a list of wisdom. God is a wise God, is a holy God. And he gives them a list of wisdom that they can use and apply in different aspects of their lives. Now, another thing that we have difficulties to understand, especially in the 21st century, is the category of holiness. What do you think about holiness? Most of the time we think of holiness as another way of talking about piety. We think of holiness as another way of talking about morality. And these are our own categories in 21st century. These are not the categories of the Old Testament. When the Old Testament is talking about holiness, is not, the Old Testament is not talking in terms of morality. It's not talking in terms of being pious. Now, when you approach the Ten Commandments with an idea of having holiness as piety, you have to do with morality, then for you, the Ten Commandments will be a set of rules that will help you as means to arrive to holiness, which is another way of missing the point. Why am I saying all of these things? Because holiness in the Old Testament is a status given by God. It's not an objective. It's not something you are aiming at. 
So aiming at holiness, it is our own category, it's our own understanding, it probably influenced by our New Testament way of reading. But remember, we are not in New Testament, we are in Old Testament. And the Old Testament reading of holiness is not an objective, it's not something you are aiming at because you don't achieve holiness in the Old Testament. Holiness is given to you as a status. And this comes because a lot of people have misunderstanding of reading. When they read Re Leviticus chapter 19 and chapter 20 and chapter 21, they misunderstand holiness, especially because of the uh, translations that we've got. Chapter 19 verse 2, for, for instance, of, of Leviticus. Many translators uh, get it wrong by translating to say that, be holy because I, the Lord your God, I am holy. Now, there's a problem there of be holy for those of you who are doing English and those of you who did Latin with me. You will know that that mood of the verb is an imperative mood. An imperative mood is a mood of orders. It's a mood of giving commands. And this is what we get in many translations. Be holy. So as if someone is given a command to make sure that they become holy because the Lord the Lord is also holy. This is not what we get when we read in the originals. In the originals is not be holy like a command. It is you are holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And that makes a very huge difference because this is an indicative mood. An indicative mood is a mood of fact. It's a fact that the people of God are holy. And holiness in the, in the Old Testament, especially in the Old Testament, it is something that God has given them. When God declares that you are now my people, they belong in the categories of holiness. They become holy people. And this has nothing to do with their behavior in the, same, in the first place. So God declares his people that they are holy by election because he elected them. Holiness is a status that God has given them. It cannot be gained, it cannot be lost, even by Israel's own efforts or failures. Because it's a status God has given them. Because you belong to me, you are a holy people. I've given you a status. You don't have to thrive to be holy. No, you are holy by virtue of belonging to me. You are holy by virtue of the fact that I have elected you. It's not something we need to achieve. It's something that is given, is conferred to them, is given to them. Now, when you think of holiness like that, you will understand why then God has given his people the Ten Commandments and many other uh, lists of wisdom that we get in the Old Testament, especially in the Torah. God did not give them as means of becoming holy because they were already holy by virtue of what God has given them. So God give, gave them the, the law so that they can be able to express the fact that they are identified with God. That's very important. You are holy and live this way so that the rest of the people may know and realize that you already belong to me. So the Ten Commandments are not given for them to achieve holiness, but they are giving to them in order for them to express how much they belong to the Holy God. These are very important matters as I'm trying to clear the land. I think I've tried my best to clear the land, but uh, if I haven't uh, achieved that, then I will have a lot of difficulties to unpack um, the 60th commandment. Now let's go to the 60th commandment now itself. Chapter 20 and verse 13. You shall not murder. Very important. So now let's look at what this passage, I mean this, this verse reminds us first. What the 60th commandment re, uh, reminds us. So the first thing that we are reminded by this commandment is that God is both Lord and the giver of life is the Lord of life and is a giver of life. These are things that we assume as we read uh, verse 13, you shall not matter. God is the Lord of life and he is the giver of life. That's why we are grateful to the Lord who gives us life, even when we do not deserve. Another thing that we are reminded as we read um, this uh, commandment is that the emphasis of this commandment is therefore on sanctity and preciousness of life. Dear friend, life is great. Life is precious. 
life is sacred. And for that reason, God says, you shall not murder. Another thing that we are reminded as we read this passage um, is that this commandment preserves the idea that God is sovereign over the end of anyone's life, of any human being or any creature that God, God is sovereign over the end of your life. He is Lord over your death. He is Lord over your life. He is the one who decides when you need to expire. It is God. He is sovereign. As the positive application of six, the sixth commandment uh, is that people have to do their best, their level best, to preserve um, their own lives first and the life of other people. This is another way of still clearing the ground because when we look at verse 13, we see the, neg the, the commandment is presented in a negative way. You shall not murder. But what it affirms, it affirms the sacredness of life. What it affirms, it affirms the fact that God, he is the giver and he is the Lord of life. He's the one who decides, he's the one who gives life, who takes away. That's the second thing. And the third thing now, as we look at this passage, let's, let's see what it rules out. When you read, you shall not murder, what is it that this passage is actually ruling out that we shouldn't do? First of all, this command rules out the whole idea of malice, being malicious. Now, the desire, if you develop a desire to diminish someone's life, you develop a desire or you arrive to the point of saying that, I wish that person dead. That's malicious. That's what this commandment is trying to rule out. You shouldn't go as far as being malicious, even if the person is your enemy, even if the person has done something terribly wrong to you. You should not develop that kind of malicious attitude to the point of wishing them dead. Why? Because life is precious. We'll look at that in a minute, uh, what this passage is actually implying. Even Jesus uh, in chapter 5 of the book of Matthew, verse 22. So Jesus is advising that we should not nurse anger against your brother. Don't, you know, go as far as thinking and um, wishing them to die. So if that is the case, because Jesus went as far as moving from action to attitudes. So when you're talking about murder, so you think of an action, Jesus goes to the attitude, goes to what happens in someone's heart. That's where it all begins. It begins with malicious thoughts. Begins when you develop ideas, look at your, at your friends, look at your neighbor, and then you begin to develop attitude of wishing them dead. So this is the first thing that this commandment is ruling out. So if we are to express, to express the fact that we belong to the Holy God, who is wise, we should not really entertain um, such kind of an attitude. The second thing that this commandment is ruling out, the commandment is ruling out all cruelty or violence that could weaken or shorten another person's life. And we are living in a culture full of violence. When you subject your friends, you subject any human being violently to the point where that kind of cruel way of dealing with a person uh, leads to shorten the life of the person. This is what this commandment is against, is ruling out. We shouldn't do that. We should not be violent to the point where we weaken someone's life. You know, sometimes, you know, there are, there are instances where you subject someone under serious interrogations um, full of torture uh, to the point where the person is, his life is just threatened to death. This is what this commandment says we should not do as believers. The third thing that this command is, commandment is ruling out is an abortion. Now, the killing of fetus. This is the case uh, because a genetic science shows that the fetus is from the moment of conception a human being in the process, if we may put it that way, in the process of arriving. The fetus, I can repeat that, is from the moment of conception, a human being in the process of arriving. Now, when you terminate the life of this fetus, you have committed murder. The fact that 
the, the several months it cannot, sorry, the fact that for several months it cannot survive, I mean the fetus cannot survive outside the womb, does not affect its right to the same protection that other human beings merit. Now when you have a look at Psalm, it's one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 139, before verse, 13, verse 14, which is a favorite verse of so many people, um, I thank you, I praise you God because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Before you get to that verse, you know, you, you see God is actually uh, describing the fact that God is aware, is involved in the life of the fetus, is in the life of the baby who's still inside of the womb. God knows, he goes as far as ordaining even the days that that particular child will live. So God is involved so actively in the life of the baby who is unborn. So when you terminate the life of that, of that, you are interfering with God's sovereignty over that particular life. So when the Bible says, you shall not murder, which means we don't have to go as far as even doing abortion. Now, abortion can only be justified, I guess, I think, uh, can only be justified and um, only when we take it as a necessary evil. Okay, when a pregnancy genuinely endangers the mother's life, uh, when there is a complicated situation in terms of pregnancy to the point where it endangers the life of one, then in that particular case, I think abortion can be allowed and allowed because in this particular case, we are still trying to protect the preciousness of life. Now, we know for sure that especially with modern technology and the, the development of science and also uh, medicine, we know that this, we have few cases of such situations, especially nowadays. Now, when we go as a nation, we know many other countries have already gone to this point. When we go as a nation legalizing abortion on any other ground or any other social ground, this is, it becomes a social evil. You know, whatever arguments we may try to bring in, the, in order to, con to convince ourselves is actually malicious. It's not something we can encourage. So this is the third uh, implication uh, of the uh, commandment number six. And the fourth one is that this commandment rules out suicide and uh, euthanasia. So it's what we call mercy dying or mercy, mercy killing. Suicide, you know, you, you may say, no, this is my life. I can decide to take, it, to take it any time I feel like. That's not your life. It's a gift of God. God has given you life. You don't have the right to terminate your own life. You don't have. Because God himself is the Lord and is also the giver of life. So when you commit suicide, which means you go against the commandment number six. What about the um, killing someone in, in the name of mercy, you know? you know? Because you don't want to see these people going through a lot of sufferings and you think suffering is something foreign from to human nature and then you help them to die fast, you know, because you feel pity about them. Even that one is not condoned because God is the one who is sovereign over life. We don't have to decide and to do such things um, on other people. So if this is what the commandment number six is all about, um, and then trying to send the message of the fact that God is the Lord and the giver of life, and therefore we should do all our best to protect the preciousness of life. The last thing I want to uh, unpack on this passage is to, there are certain things that this passage does not really rule out. I mean, this commandment does not rule out that we may think uh, they are actually murdered, but they are not. God's people, if you read the Bible, especially during history and church history, God's people have always recognized that there are some situations where taking of a life is not only permitted, but actually warranted. First one is in a situation of self-defense. So self-defense, you know, the protection of your own life, the protection of the life of those who are, who are with you uh, cannot be considered as a violation of this command and cannot be taken as an exception to this command. Why? 
because it actually affirms the commandment. It's not an exception, but it affirms the commandment because the commandment is talking about how we should do all our best to preserve life. Now, if there's someone who comes and he wants to terminate your life, which is precious, or terminate the life of those around you, and in the process of defending yourself, you end up killing those people, I don't think you have committed murder. I think you have done your best to preserve the preciousness of life. There are so many situations in Zambia, probably because we, um, we just read news of war, uh, you know, uh, happening around us. But in so many, I've, I've done ministry among refugees, um, and they've shared with me so disturbing uh, scenarios and instances they've gone through when someone has just broken into your house and decided to rape you, uh, uh, to rape your, your, your daughters or maybe your wife in, in your presence and torturing you and forcing you to look at everything that is happening. Uh, you don't have to. So the situation like that, if you have any ability to save and preserve your life, then in that self-defense you are doing, you are preserving not only your life and the lives of the other people, so you can kill, and in that particular situation, killing is like a necessary evil. It's an evil to preserve so many lives. So even the Old Testament is actually clear about this. This cannot be actually put under uh, a violation of the sixth command, but otherwise it's going to be put in, under the category of preserving life that God has given us. So self-defense um, is not something that we can put under that category. The second one is just war, when the war is justified. It's another extended principle where soldiers, if you're involved in military, uh, and then you target a certain group of people in order to preserve your people, especially when they are justifiable reasons, and then you go and preserve so many lives in that way I don't think you are violating this command. I think you are preserving life. Another, another situation is uh, execution of a death sentence. Now here we need to make a, a, a distinction between what we can do as private individuals and what the state can do. So death, the death sentence or capital punishment is reserved given to, the, to a government. It's not, we shouldn't take the law by ourselves. This is what we read in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 to 15, which was wrong, um, a wrong thing that Moses did. You know, he took the, um, the law in his own hands and then he killed and he murdered someone. Uh, so this is actually reserved and given to the government. The government is an instrument of God. They stand on behalf of God. God is the one who is the giver and the taker of life but he has mandated the government to actually do that. So when a murderer is actually uh, murdered, is killed, or is, is put to, uh, on sentence to death, that cannot be called a murder. So this is what this passage is actually talking about. And what I wanted just to achieve in my sermon this afternoon, um, I, I know I've said a lot of things, but is to make you and I appreciate the preciousness, the preciousness and the gifts of life. Life is precious, and do your level best to preserve life. Amen. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you this afternoon, um, for we know that you are the giver and the taker of life. You are the Lord um, over life and the Lord over death. And this afternoon, Lord, what an opportunity you've given us to appreciate the fact that we are alive and help us, Lord, to always think of other people so that we can protect and preserve their lives as well. Lord, forgive us if we have gone against uh, this commandment, especially by being malicious. How many times did we wish other people dead? Oh, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us and make us um, your people once, once again. Make us people who are ready to exhibit the fact that we belong to you. All these things we pray for the sake of the Lord Jesus. Amen.